Good evening and welcome to the Scarborough Board of Education meeting on Thursday, November 17, 2016. I will be conducting this meeting, the meeting this evening, until we elect a new chair. May I have attendance, please? Yes. Mrs. Bailey? Here. Mrs. Leifer? Here. Mrs. Massingill? Here. Dr. Miles? Here. Mrs. Murphy? Here. Ms. Perry? Here. Mrs. Shea? Here. Ms. Hobbs? Here. And welcome, Mr. Vashon. Thank you. <laughs> Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. There are no adjustments to the agenda tonight. Public comment on agenda items. Does anyone from the public wish to speak on any of tonight's agenda items? <laughs> They're so funny. <laughs> we love them. Um, is there a student report tonight? Um, I'm so sorry. I left my student report at home. <laughs> but um, I think something that we could talk about when we discussed was how we chose Thomas to be our new school board representative. So what we did is we called together a group of the student leaders at the high school. So those were uh, class officers, student council members, um, as well as the leaders and boards of organizations at the school. There were National Honor Society board members there, uh, Key Club Interact, um, ECOs, which is our environmental um, protection club, um, and a couple other groups were there. Um, like Stormbrook here and other clubs. And so we thought that they would be the best people to give off the voice of the students. And then so we gathered them and then we talked to the junior class and we said, here's what this opportunity is. If any of you would like to take it, come talk to us. And so then we had two candidates, it was Thomas and another junior, and they both gave fantastic speeches and the people spoke, and now we have Tom. <laughs> 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 during this time. Um, <laughs> um, our National Honor Society has been very busy. Um, in September, we mailed off about 1,000, 1,200 books, I think it was, um, for uh, grades three and four children to uh, Sierra Leone as part of the African Library Project. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm actually the president of the Scarborough chapter of the National Honor Society. Um, so I kind of helped lead up that project. Um, it's something that I've done in the past before um, on my own, and it was fantastic. And it was incredibly, uh, I think it was incredibly good as a bonding experience for a lot of the National Honor Society members, and to see the effects of that. I actually got an email today with the National Honor Society certificate saying that we finished and it was a success and they have received all of our books and so now they can start reading them and using them and it's just really fantastic. Um, so Tuesday night we actually had our National Honor Society induction. Um, so we inducted I think around 30 new members, which is bonkers, that's so many new kids. Um, and I have gotten the opportunity to talk to a lot of them. And the future of National Honor Society is that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the students in the Alternative Ed program um, are working towards the empty bowl luncheon, um, so in their ceramics class. So they're making hundreds of bowls, which are going to be sold with homemade soup on December 22nd. Uh, money raised from this event is going to be donated to Preble Street. 
Um, as part of the project, the students uh, are volunteering at Preble Street this fall, so that would be really fantastic. Um, on November 2nd, there was a math meet at South Portland. Um, so there's a sophomore at our school named Eric Youth, and he led the team to an incredible win. Um, so it's a over 50 point win. Um, so, and their next math meet is going to be on December 7th in Feldman. Um, so we have some students of the quarter from the PATHS program, um, Chandon McCall and Darren Ingraham. So it says these two students were recently recognized by PATHS for their outstanding work ethic and positive attitude. Um, so it's very exciting. So the Scarborough Oak Hill players just finished our fall musical called Crazy For You. Um, and that was incredibly successful. Thomas and I were both lucky enough to get to participate this year. I played a bossy showgirl. He played a hilarious British man uh, who kind of <laughs> saved the day. And it was spectacular. Um, and the music was great, and the costumes were great, and the was great. And we had such an amazing turnout. I know a lot of people in here came and saw it. And first of all, thank you for coming and supporting us. Um, and so much of the Scarborough community came out and supported us, and it was just breathtaking because you can't normally see the audience, but there were certain parts when you were just like, you're like, look at all those faces, <laughs> look at all those people. Um, I don't want to add to that. Um, I, I'd just like to say that for half the show, I wasn't wearing glasses, so I can't attest to that. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Thomas wasn't allowed to wear his glasses before the show. Um, <laughs> Um, the Model United Nations Club uh, successfully completed its biannual antique show and vintage marketplace on October 29th, um, and they are currently conducting a community service project this week, um, and it's a quarter drive for Haiti that raises money for school lunches in rural village schools. Um, we had a lot of people uh, going and donating quarters today, and it was really cool because today was our big Thanksgiving lunch that we have every year, and, you know, it was kind of like, hey, while you're going to get your food, why don't you donate all the change you have? And I think it's going pretty well. Yeah, I talked to Mr. Transavito, and uh, he said that the quarter drive was incredibly successful. I personally donated, that's for sure. <laughs> um, but when, when I donated, I, I asked him about it, and um, he said that the fundraiser was going so that's fantastic. Um, in October, um, students selected nine sophomores to participate in the Natural Helpers program. Um, so all the newly selected members and all 12 existing members um, got together and attended a one-day retreat sponsored by the Day One organization. Um, the retreat provided training to the new members and it was an opportunity for them to interact with natural helpers from other schools in the area. Um, during the month of November, the Natural Helper Helpers are sponsoring a volleyball tournament. This has become an annual event since 2014. Uh, the teams consist of students and staff members, and all the proceeds from the tournament are going to be donated to the Animal Refuge League. Um, the Natural Helpers are also going to sponsor additional school-wide events th throughout the year. Um, unfortunately, I was going to be in the volleyball tournament, and then I signed up too late, so get to play, but I know a lot of people who are, and they say that it's going really well, so it's fun. Um, so for Key Club, on November 8th, um, they did a drive for the National Bone Marrow Registry, um, and they got 17 people to sign up, which is really good, um, and so they are participating in leaf raking <coughs> for elderly people in Scarborough, and they are... Uh, participating in the Thirst Project on November 9th. So there was a presentation um, to inform students about the global water crisis. I have a couple of friends who were able to attend that, and they said that it was kind of mind-blowing, the things that they didn't know. So that went very successfully. Um, there was a financial wellness fair on Wednesday, Wednesday October 19th. Um, Scarborough High School seniors had the opportunity to explore some of life's financial questions and choices, um, and they spent the morning working with folks from town and country, federal credit union, kind of getting a foundation for all of their financial questions and things like that. And athletic highlights. Um, so all of our teams have done really well. Uh, cross country girls finished 10th of the state meet. Cross country boys finished 7th. 
uh, football reach regional finals, um, and they have a record of 8-3, <coughs> which I understand is one of the best records they've had in a while, which is great for them. Um, so girls soccer also had an incredibly strong finish, and they made it to the regional finals, and they were the regional runners-up. Uh, volleyball made it to the state finals and were runners-up. Um, and golf had three athletes who qualified for individual championships, and they also qualified as a team for state championship. Uh, field hockey reached the regional semifinals, and they were also awarded the Class A State Sportsmanship Award. Um, and boys soccer also made it to the regional semifinals. So all of our fall athletics went very well this year, and I know we're all incredibly proud of them. So there we go. Very good. Thank you. Thanks for remembering that, Thomas. <laughs> So I had the opportunity to attend the National Honor Society induction the other night, and listening to the accomplishments of our students was just really mind-boggling in a really good, positive way. They are Our students are so involved in so many things. Um, it's amazing to really see how much time they're devoting above and beyond their schoolwork, their academics, um, and their, their extracurriculars. So, and congratulations to all of our kids for being so awesome. Um, next up, new business. The meeting minutes for November 3rd, 2016. Do I have a motion on the meeting minutes for November 3rd, 2016? So moved. Second. Are there any changes to the minutes or any discussion? <coughs> How many, uh, all in favor? Sure. I was there. No, it was not. One, seven. seven. All in favor? Is that with Jackie? No, six. Oh, okay. no, Jack. Jackie wasn't here. Jackie right. was Sorry. <laughs> six in favor and those two to go. I'm very new at this. So. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, next uh, on the agenda is the election of the chair of the Board of Education. Are there any nominations for the position of the chair of the Board of Education? I nominate Kelly Murphy. Second. Second. Is there any discussion? I have a discussion. I just want to say that <clears throat> any member of this Board of Education is very capable of sitting in the chair's position. And, and I don't think I've ever been able to make that statement publicly that mm -hmm. any member sitting could serve as the chair because this board is one of the best boards I've ever worked with, number one. And number two, I don't know of a member sitting who has a, an agenda or an ax to grind except to provide the best education for this town. And Mrs. Bealey is probably the best communicator that has ever sat in that chair. And I thank her for that. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. you. Are there any other questions? Jody? Um, I'd just like to echo what Donna said and that um, Donna and what Jackie said about Donna. She has done a great job in keeping us informed of, of things that are going on. It's been a goal of ours over the last couple of years to sort of improved communication within the board, but also with the superintendent and um, the community. And I think Donna has gone above and beyond in reaching out to the members of the community that email us. She calls them, she emails back, she does a lot um, behind the scenes that we, you know, take for granted. So we appreciate that. Thank you very much. And um, I'm looking forward to Kelly taking over the reins. It actually makes anyone reluctant to follow Donna's footsteps. <laughs> <laughs> She's kind of built up the job of chair to be something maybe it's not as attainable. <laughs> I'm sure you'll do fine, Kelly. <laughs> <coughs> do I have a motion to elect Kelly Murphy as the chair of the Board of Education? Oh, okay. Before, were there any additional nominations? I tried to say that earlier. None? None? Okay. Do I have a motion? Do we have Kelly Murphy? Yeah, yeah. We have a motion. Just 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 motion. Just
So the less I talk, the better it is for everyone. But. <laughs> okay, so we're going to move on to item 7.3. Well, and thank you, everyone, by the way. Um, 7.3, election of the vice chair of the Board of Education. Do we have any nominations? Uh, I move that Jody Shea be nominated for vice chair. Second. So do we have a, um, a discussion about that? Mm -hmm. I don't I think Jody's very capable of, of taking on the role of the first chair. She's done a great job of finance last year, and as long as she promises to do both, I'll be okay. <laughs> <coughs> Are there any other nominations? Okay. We're all jumping at it. Um, okay, so all in favor of Jody Shea? <laughs> Looks unanimous. All right, thank you. Make sure you know it could go higher. <laughs> okay, so that brings us to 8.0. Oh, it's nice. Thank you. Um, now we are moving on to the workshop portion. Um, 8.1 is a NEASC update. policy committee is contaminated, so we're, <laughs> all of us are following these things. Um, so before we get started on our presentation, I just uh, want to take a moment to thank uh, Don Dewey for a fantastic job as chair. We greatly appreciate the support you've shown in the leadership, and to congratulate Ms. Murphy and Ms. <coughs> Jay for their new leadership roles. I also want to mention how uh, happy and excited and proud I am representing the high school to have Thomas on board. Lizzie does a fantastic job, and now with Thomas there, we have great representation, not just at the high school, but for all students throughout the district. So welcome aboard. We're proud to have Thomas there. And uh, fortunately for you tonight, this NIAS presentation isn't going to be just me. I'm uh, very happy to have Warren Bornstein joining me tonight. Lauren is one of the two co-chairs uh, for the steering committee. Dave O'Connor is the other co-chair. Um, and, and what we're going to attempt to do tonight is give you uh, a little review of what we talked about last year about the NEAS process, just to kind of bring you up to speed to remind you of what's happening. And then Lauren is going to talk to you about the work that's been completed to date. Uh, I've asked that each of you that have this these notes, this is not just for notes, because we are always want to be lifelong learners. Those of you that know the transitions are very important. So I ask that you write on a scale of one to four, the transitions. One meaning needing drastic improvement, four meaning top of the line, better than the superintendent's transitions. Feel free to put whatever you want, and then I'll collect your feedback when we're done with it. Um, so to start with, uh, we want to talk a little bit about the accreditation process. And, and when we review this with you, um, please feel free to take some notes. And at the end of the presentation, if you have questions of Lauren or myself or, or uh, Catherine, who's a part of that steering committee, feel free to uh, ask those during the, the review and the question and answer period. So accreditation, just to remember, what is this, what is this process about? So this process is about a self-evaluation. It's where we look at what we do as a school and school district, soup to nuts. And we're evaluating, as a school, um, our programs, our services, all of that is a part of a self-study evaluation. And then we're going to have a visiting committee come here, and they're going to take a look at our evaluation of the work that we've done. And they're also going to spend four very comprehensive days interviewing, talking to people, looking at our evidence, and trying to get a sense of where we are as a school in not only in regards to the standards for accreditation, but our own educational goals that we've set as a school district. So that's the purpose of and value of the accreditation process. 
The standards that you'll hear us mention from time to time in this presentation, these are the seven standards that are a part of the assessment that the accreditation process gives us feedback on. And these are best practice research-based standards, and each of the committees that Lauren's going to reference have responsibility for the seven different standards and collecting evidence and, and meeting with people and gathering everything we can soup to nuts in each of those seven areas. <laughs> Something from the crowd except laughter. Right. So, uh, for those of you who had your head down looking at the notes, this is going to take a little bit of time so you can experience what Allison just did, which is, there we go. So, the three-phase accreditation process. Um, we have a reflective 12 to 18 month self study, which began last spring. And as Lauren's going to talk a little bit about, we already have one committee who's already been moving forward last year because it's extremely important their work lead the rest of the standards work. So we started last year, and this 12 to 18 month self-study will basically end at the end of this school year and at the beginning of the fall. Next, November 5 through 8, we will have a four-day site visit. This visit is going to be made up of 16 educators from various schools throughout New England who are there to basically do what I had mentioned to you earlier, which is look at the self-study, look at the Endicott survey, meet it's both Lauren and I have been on committees, site committees last year. It's professional development on steroids. It is the most comprehensive, in-depth study of a school district and a school that I've ever seen over four days. That committee will be here next fall. And the multi-year follow-up process is basically what I'm going to reference here in a second, which is after this when we, when we conduct the self-study, it's everything that I mentioned before. It's the educational program, services, and processes as it relates to the seven standards. It's our school district being reflective. And looking at those things that we do that we believe are strengths, <coughs> those strengths and taking feedback from our self-study and from the visiting committee and identifying areas that we need to improve and making sure those improvement efforts align with the district's goals. So on the on-site evaluation visit, that four-day on-site evaluation, and you're going to hear more about this next year, so I don't want to spend too much time on this right now, but really the entire community is involved in this site. It's just not the high school. It'll be our responsibility to get all the stakeholders that are a part of what we do here to be involved with meeting with these different committee members and examining everything that we do. So that happens, as I mentioned before, on November 5th through the 8th. The multi-year follow-up. So technically speaking, in NEAS speak, we're going to be taking the report and the evidence and the feedback, and we're going to look at what, at the district level, we believe are our improvement efforts, and we're going to create a plan. That plan will be aligned with the plan we have at the district level. And we will have feedback from that committee and NEAS to support that plan. And they'll be checking in with us periodically and helping guide us through those improvement efforts and making sure that it aligns with what we're currently doing at the local level. So how do we look at this? Um, really the most important thing to glean from this, which Lauren and David have done a fantastic job with with our staff, is this. We have tried to become that school community that it's continuous school improvement to be reflective educators. Whether it's taking a look at the lesson you just taught and deciding whether you need to improve on that for the next class or what you're doing as uh, a teacher, our schedule, transportation, athletics and activities, whatever we have in place, we try to create that reflective type of environment for continuous school improvement. So this process basically is going to allow us, like I said a few minutes ago, these are our strengths, let's build on them. These are the areas we need to improve. What do we choose to have as our improvement efforts that align with our goals as a district? And that's really what that multi-year follow-up is going to be about. This last slide is basically, I think, really important to highlight and to, and to, to make sure that we're giving a lot of very positive feedback and, and the thank yous out as it should be. Because the resources that we've needed to do for this accreditation process were enormous. 
And from the very beginning, this board and our leadership council that's sitting around this table have been 100% support in putting whatever we needed to have in place to have this work done. Really important leadership. We have fantastic leaders. Lauren and David are doing a great job of leading this entire effort and the rest of the steering committee. We have seven very strong and well-respected school leaders that are the chairs of the standards. The planning and preparation has been fantastic. The stakeholder involvement, people have been stepping up, parents, students, the staff, and just so you'll know, we have the entire professional staff that's involved in this. And in some of the ass cell studies, that's not the case. There's a targeted <coughs> few to take on that work. Our entire professional staff are a part of these committees and doing this work. The budget that you supported as a board for this work has been instrumental in us being able to do this successfully. And finally, the professional development time. As you heard me speak on numerous occasions last year, every NEASC um, school that I spoke to that had gone through this, and when I talked to the executive director, they all said, the one thing you don't want to do is take your existing professional development and put it on the shelf just to do the NEAS cell study. So we haven't done that as a district. Because of your support, the additional late starts, and the way we've structured our meeting time at the high school, we're able to continue that professional development that we had in place that we felt was so important, and we've been able to earmark time for NEAS. So we wanted to thank you for, for that support. And in terms of leadership, I'm now going to turn it over to Lauren. And she's going to take you through where we are in the process. This is Lauren Bornstein. OK. Well, first of all, I want to thank you all for having me here. Um, and I just want to say that as I was practicing my presentation, which I did because I am much more comfortable talking to teenagers than I am to adults, um, I realized that there is so much that we're doing and so many little intricacies with this NEAS process that I can't even convey to you everything that we're doing. So I'm going to do my best to kind of give you a snapshot of what we've been working on this year, um, but just know that there is always more than I'm saying. Um, so first, what you'll see up here on the slide is this is the members of our steering committee at the high school. So the steering committee is basically the committee that oversees all of the work for NEAS. So the types of things that we do, I would say primarily, we are helping manage the work and um, give clear guidelines to the staff as they're working. Also something that we're, we've been doing is being in contact with P people from NEASC to clarify things and ask questions. Um, providing support and troubleshooting for things that come up at the school. And eventually we'll be writing the um, community summary, which is part of the report that we're going to hopefully finish at the very end of this year that captures what our community is and um, important information that our visiting committee will need to know when they come and see us. Um, great thing about our steering committee, um, just like Principal Creech said, I, myself, and Principal Creech and Monique actually have been on visiting committees at schools. They're actually all volunteers. So all the people that come to our school in the fall, it's going to be teachers and principals and superintendents from New England that have volunteered their time to come take a look at our school. So we did the same thing. So we have a good sense of what the end goal of all of this will be and what the impact can be for our school if we um, kind of take it head on. Um, and also I want to say that David O'Connor, who's the other steering chair, went through NEASC with Scarborough High School last time we did it, so he definitely has a good perspective on where we've come since then. Um, did you believe the good transitions for me? No. Okay. I don't know if at all. Okay. All right. Very concerned. All right, so what you're going to see here is these are um, what Principal Preach referenced before. These are the teachers that we have as our standards chairs for the seven different committees um, that are looking at different aspects of our school. So you notice that basically the first four standards look more at the school academically and what the values of the school are in ter terms of academics and environment. And the last three more look at the school culture and um, the relationship the school has with the community. So um, these seven committee chairs have been in charge of groups of staff members that are looking closely at this standard. Um, they, these seven people, I have only heard amazing positive feedback from <coughs> seven of them. Um, they work very hard to plan meetings and sort of 
give good guidelines for their staff members and help them along the way. Um, they, which has been a huge undertaking for all of them, have, to, have had to spend a lot of time familiarizing themselves with NEASC and what NEASC means and what all the indicators and the standards represent. And that um, for someone, a lot of these people have never dealt with NEASC before is quite the undertaking. So I've been really impressed with them. Um, and our philosophy as a steering committee has really been to give these people the autonomy to run their group and, and how they think is best. So how they're going to split up their group members, um, if they're going to meet as a group or as small groups. Um, and they've really been excellent. Um, I've been very impressed with them. We've had some great meetings with the seven of us and the steering committee, and there's just been such great exchange of ideas. Um, so it's pretty, it's pretty exciting to see. Um, in terms of our staff and getting our staff starting to work on this, last spring, we, well, first of all, I want to say that a huge priority for us was making our staff feel invested and empowered by this because it is overwhelming and it's a lot of work, um, but the outcome is great. So we wanted staff to feel like they had a positive role in all of this. So we let staff members tell us their preferences for the standards that they wanted to work with, and we worked really hard to make sure that staff members were a part of the group that they felt particular interest in. So there are always staff members that want to look really closely at curriculum and how curriculum is implemented in the classroom. But then there are also staff members that are really interested in um, the resources that the school offers beyond just classroom teachers. So we um, let all staff members fill out a form where they listed their preferences and we worked really hard to give every staff member um, one of their preferences to work on. Um, we also have been talking a lot about getting students and community members involved in this process. Um, and we have reached out to students and some community members, and individual standards groups have been in touch with both students and community members. So we have students a part of some of our standards groups and community members as well. And I'm gonna get to this a little bit later, but in our collection process of evidence, the student and community voice is being heard in terms of the evidence that we're collecting to prove our, stand um, to prove our indicators. Um, and lastly, the last thing I want to say is that students and community members are really going to become involved as we prepare for this site visit next fall. As Principal Creech said, this is uh, the school that I went to, the whole town is involved um, in really kind of showing this visiting committee what our, school, what our school will be about. So we're going to be tapping into students and community members as well. Yeah, you did leave the board once for me. <laughs> okay. Sorry. So another thing that we did last spring, this was sort of the first step that we took to start collecting evidence, was we had our all of our staff, students, and some parents fill out what was called the Endicott survey. So the Endicott survey is a survey that's designed by Endicott College for NEASC. And it basically looks at these four areas of what a school is all about. So academic, leadership, school climate, school environment, and the services that a school offers. The great thing about the Endicott survey is that when we got the results back, it breaks all the results so they fit with each of the standards that we're working on. So we don't have to sort through the data and decide which questions apply to each standard. Um, so this has been a very important piece of data for us. Um, and if you look at, um, well, I'll show you some of the numbers of the participation that we've had. That's so, good. sorry, that one was pretty good. That was pretty good. That's, that's one of my favorites. Um, that on your <laughs> I think that was a repeat, though, wasn't it? I don't know. Okay, so, um, well, the first thing I want to say is that we're really proud of our participation for this, and. Um, Couple things to note is um, our student participation. Of course, there are students that are not able to take this type of survey, so that accounts for some um, of students that were not able to take it. Um, parents, so the parent percentage that you'll see up there, we reach out to parents to take the survey in lots of different ways. And what that percentage doesn't account for is that um, we counted total parents as literally all the parents for every student in our school. So what that doesn't take into account is multiple siblings in one household and two parent households. So, you know, mom and dad probably wouldn't both take the survey. It would be one survey result for that family. Um, so we've been using this data as a start of our collection process of where we stand in some of these <coughs> standards and indicators. So ultimately, each standard group is going to be writing a report 
on our school, capturing where our school is and how we measure up to a certain standard. Um, and so how we're getting to those reports is through a similar process that we always use at the high school for every decision that we make. Um, and basically what that cycle is, is that if something is going to get decided in the school, first the high school always gives staff the opportunity to give some feedback. So just in the same way for NIAS, first step is departments will look at something and give certain feedback on it. <coughs> Next, it goes back to the committee if they would like to do any edits. And finally, it has to be voted on by the staff. So what you'll notice up here is that the steering committee spent a lot of time planning, how are we going to get this all accomplished in this year? So looking at our schedule and figuring out when are we going to get all these reports done? When are we going to get them voted on? And how are we going to get um, everybody a chance to give some feedback? So this little table up here, you'll see that for the seven standards, we've assigned dates for the day that they should have it ready for department feedback, the day that they can edit and make changes if they'd like, and then when the full staff will vote on it. So what you'll notice is that on this chart, there are some dates from September. So we actually have already been through this decision-making cycle for the first thing that the core values and beliefs group did, which is group number one. The first thing that they had to do, and what they actually started working on last spring, was the mission statement for the high school. And we felt that that had to get done first, because that's going to drive the rest of our work <coughs> in the high school. So you'll notice that they had that ready for departments on September 8th, which was right there at the beginning of the year. Um, then they had a chance to edit on the 15th, and our, our staff voted on it on the 22nd, 91 to 1. So it was overwhelmingly <laughs> approved by the staff. Um, and what you'll see on the next slide, this is um, some language from the mission statement that our whole staff has voted on. It reads, Scarborough High School is committed to establishing a student-centered environment that is safe, supportive, and respectful for all members of its community. We are dedicated to lifelong learning, college and career readiness, high academic standards, and citizenship. So what you'll notice about that, that this, this committee worked very hard on to write this, and then a full document about the mission statement of the school, is that it's very much um, focused on stu student-centered learning, which is something that our whole district is very focused on. So that common thread was very apparent. Um, so far this fall, this is a very condensed version of what we've been working on. Um, the first thing that all of the committees had to do is decide okay, we need to see where our school measures up to the standard and all of these indicators that fall underneath the standard, what kinds of things can we use as evidence to prove where we are? So groups had to spend a lot of time deciding, what is evidence for what we do? So that could be something as simple as anecdotal evidence, what teachers or students experience day to day at the school. It could be evidence like, meeting notes from a community dialogue in our community. Um, it could be a um, agenda for a leadership meeting and what they're going to be discussing. So groups had to sit down and think about what are all the things that we do in the district that could serve as evidence for meeting one of these standards, standards or how we measure up. Um, then, of course, all the groups had to gather that evidence which was quite the undertaking if you can think of all the places that you have to find this evidence. <coughs> so groups worked very hard and it was definitely something we had to kind of work through together was to figure out what's the best way to gather this evidence. How do we access people outside of the school? How do we get teachers to take some time to reflect and say what kind of evidence can I provide for this? Um, and find a way to capture individual um, anecdotal evidence. So one thing that we did was um, had lots of people interview pe uh, people. Principal Creech was a, a very popular one to be interviewed and people um, in the community and capture some of the evidence that they could provide. Um, next, groups worked to organize um, the evidence and decide does it work for their standard? Which indicator does it match with? Um, and then of course figure out where the holes still are and access more evidence. Um, and I want to say that on November 8th, which was election day, the students didn't have school, but the staff did. And it was very busy at the high school, with lots of people showing up, but the staff was 
very hard at work, and I was extremely impressed with the amount of work that got done that day. Um, there's just something about having a long chunk of time to do something when you really see progress happening. And um, I can confidently say that all the groups really took time to organize their evidence, and even some groups are starting to think about writing up their report and drafting how we sort of match with the indicators that are given to us. So that's sort of where we are now, and obviously some groups are in different places, and as you notice from that schedule, we have some committees that need to be ready to start presenting to us in January. Um, but groups are starting to think about writing their narratives for matching these standards and um, finish gathering up that evidence and starting to organize it. And then as a steering committee, are we talking today about, oh, now we have to start thinking about the visit. Now we have to start thinking about planning for this epic marathon four-day visit that will happen in the fall and thinking about all the logistics and how we want to present our school in those four days. Um, all right, we are at the question and answer slide. And before we get to your questions, I just want to point out a couple of things on this slide. One is that the website that you have in front of you, um, it brings you to the part of the NEASC website that's just about public secondary schools. So that little DPSS is actually very helpful or else you're getting lost in international schools and colleges and all that kind of stuff. So, um, and then the last thing is we have our emails up there, myself, um, Ellen Bornstein, and then Ava Connor. As I said earlier, we're the steering chairs, so the two of us are leading the steering committee and this work that we're doing at the high school. Also, um, Principal Creech, your email is up there, and you can always find people's emails in the handbook or online, so even if they're not up there, you can still email them, don't you worry. <laughs> all right, does anyone have any questions? Yes. So do you, um, wait, after you've gathered all your evidence and all the information about your goals for the future, does it go to this team that will come in in the fall, does that go in springtime? Or when does that go to them? And when are they selected and then are they receive? The group that's visiting? Mm. So, well, I'll say that when I was on my visiting committee, I had a copy of the school's self-study, which was the report that they'd written for themselves. Mm -hmm. And I, that was a huge piece of evidence for me when I visited them because mm -hmm. they know themselves best. So the report that they gave to me was, for me, a great snapshot of where that school is. Um, so they will have it when they come visit us in the fall and use that as a piece of evidence for looking at our school. What they have is they have a website that, and I, uh, what Lauren's referencing is when I went on my site, I did the same thing. The chair will tell you that you can read all the reports, but you really should focus on the standard that you're going to be working on. So there's 16 people, and there's a chair and a co-chair, and mm -hmm. the other 14 pair up for a standard. So what we were asked to do is you would go and look at the report that the school has written on your standard, and then you take the Endicott survey that specifically addresses that standard, yeah. and you use that as a, as a kind of a springboard, a starting point, for you to get a sense of where the school is before you ever arrive. Right, so they'll have that sense, and then when they get here, and when I got to my school, all the other evidence includes speaking with teachers and students and community members and just being at the school and observing what the school is doing. So do they get that in the spring or in the summer or I don't remember well, until the fall? That they'll have that collected by us and then they'll be formulating all of that in the summertime. Okay. Then once they have their assignments, because it's not until November 5 through 8. Oh, okay. So in the fall is when NEAS will be deciding, trying to gather those volunteers that Lauren mm -hmm. referenced to go to these different sites and then mm -hmm. they start to get that information out a couple of months before your visit. Okay. Okay. Can I just, actually the protocol for NEAS is six weeks. Mm -hmm. The report has to be ready for six weeks before to send to the school, and they will probably do the team in the spring, and begin asking in the spring for the fall. Sorry. No, they they tried it, and they, yeah. as you know, they sometimes it's a challenge with all the schools that they have to. So they start as early as Andrew. So. Yeah. I have a question regarding your dates or the dates for the. Um, site visit. Mm -hmm. So you said it's November 5th through 8th. Um, election day does happen to fall in there. So what yeah. is the plan for, how does that site visit work? I mean, on the 5th you do community introductions, and the 6th they're in the school with the kids. How does that all play out? So that's a great question. This year is a unique year because of the nature of the type of election and how many voters mm -hmm. are coming out. So 
I believe that's why the board decided this year not to have students there. But in the past, we've had a regular school day where we still have students and staff there. We'll have business as usual. And Tony and the rest of the crew here does a fantastic job of coordinating with our in-house people to make sure that we've got everything secure and that we can have 1,000 students and 150 staff do their normal business while people come in and vote. So if it had been uh, this year that this was happening, we probably would have asked NIAS to use a different date and maybe moved it to the spring if it had been this year, which they will do. Yeah. As long as it's within that that's calendar year, school year, excuse me. Yeah, and on the Tuesday of that visit, um, they mostly are observing a normal school day at that point. So it's not like we'll have everyone from the community there at school on, on Tuesday. That usually happens more at the beginning of the visit. So it will be a busy day. Though. Sunday and Monday, there's a lot. There's a lot of front loading of what Lauren was just talking about. Getting the board talking, parents, community members on Tuesday. They're right now starting to look at writing their reports. So they're making those last minute visits, going to classrooms, shadowing students, having those kinds of conversations, because they leave on Wednesday. So they've got to be generating that. So they've already collected a lot. That's why we were saying, I mean, it is, it is comprehensive. You have to get a lot of information as a visiting committee between Sunday afternoon and really Tuesday afternoon. Okay. Go for it. Um, so is every every staff member involved in the group? Every professional staff member is involved. Okay. Yes. And then I have one more question. I have to figure out where I put it. Um, oh, so when you were saying that after they have looked through all of the notes and collected all of their evidence, <coughs> that they go through and they kind of compare that to the standards. And I was just wondering, is it on some kind of like, is like a 10 point scale? Is it like, how, how is it rated? And is there numerical data or is it just anecdotal kind of? Um, the evidence that we collect is everything. Mm -hmm. So numerical and anecdotal. Um, the standards are, it's, they're written sort of like what, an ideal school should have. Um, and then there's indicators underneath the standard. So as a school, we have to decide where are we in terms of that ideal. And then when we write our report, um, we acknowledge sort of where we are, you know, not on a scale one to yeah. 10, but using language like the majority of, or many, or something like that to kind of decide where So it's kind of like a rubric for the school. Yeah. Okay. It is, and Lauren and I have talked about this a lot. We, have, we didn't have the exact ex same experience with our committee work, but what happens is, so if Lauren and I were doing standard one, core values and beliefs, and the mission statement, so we would be spending a majority of our time collecting evidence, but all the rest of the committee are out, and they're observing classes, they're doing uh, shadowing students, talking to teachers. So they really, even though it's not their standard, they're really kind of getting a sense of things in that standard too. So Lauren and I would write our report and then we would report it out. So what we did in our committee is we would report it out on the screen and we would read through our report and our findings and then the entire committee can chime in and say, well, uh, I also had these conversations or I know the social studies department does this or I know the building principal and they add to that conversation to either add evidence <coughs> or if they observe something that's different than what we put in our report. And then the entire committee then agrees on what, where they think our school is with that indicator and that standard. Yeah, and I also want to say too that when you look at the NIAS language and you think about the visiting committee coming, it's, it's a lot to think about, oh, how do we, where do we fall on this and how do we match up and what are they going to think of us? And the, the real value of this process that I've been getting is it just gives staff and students and community members an opportunity to actually just stop for a second and take a look and just think about what we do as a school. So I'm, you know, I'm working really hard to kind of take it as that, as, a, as an opportunity for us as a school to really just think about what we do um, and give us some guidelines of, of what to look at as a school. So yeah, we, when you start thinking about all the indicators and the standards, it, it becomes overwhelming. But, um, Mostly it's just been a really good learning opportunity for me and I think a lot of others. Well, I, I have served on two visiting committees in my oh, career. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the bottom line when I was doing this is, is 
the school doing what they say they're doing? When you make a re when you do a report on a standard, are you actually doing what you say you're doing? And that was one of the criteria that that we were instructed to look for. Is it is it what's happening, or is it what they would like to think is happening, or is it in La La Land? That's actually a great point because we have been preaching from day one. This is about being authentic. This is about being honest with where Absolutely. we are. And, that, and there's a lot of times where what we do right now in, in our self-study and what we report out, because I experienced this, I don't know if Lauren did in her school, there were initiatives and things happening that were in the planning phases when they did the self-study. But by the time the committee comes and visits, they had actually started implementing it. And so that, that's the authentic piece, where you're assessing where you are right now. But you know, for instance, uh, 20th, 21st century learning expectations. So we have adopted the guiding principles for that. So right now, we, didn't, we haven't had a list for the entire school district to go by for that. So we reflect that in our report. But this time next year, hopefully, we're implementing that. And that's a part of what we do as a regular. And that's what the committee would look at and see. No, they didn't have that in place at the time of the self-study. But this is what the school is currently doing with the, the guiding principles. So it's we've been pushing. It's authentic. Tell them where we are and what we're trying to move toward, and then they get a chance to assess it, just like you just said. And we're, the reality is, we're not going to get much out of it if we're not being authentic with mm -hmm. it and just doing it for me ask and not for ourselves. So we really have been telling staff we're taking a snapshot of what we do as a school, and then we can work from there. Well, the result of our last report is the fact that we had a total renovation of our high school. Well, I think a lot of schools go through that. Any other questions? So before we step down, not, as, not only is Lauren a fantastic English teacher, and I've been able to observe her, but she is a great leader through this, as is Dave O'Connor. So I really appreciate her leadership and what she's been doing. Thank you. Thank you. I have bronchitis, so the less talking I do, the less coughing I do. So I'm going to leave it to you, Julie, to run the show. Sure. Um, so we, I asked um, our leadership council, I was going to say we decided together, but um, <laughs> I truly believe part of part of my, my values as a leader is that it's important for us as a team to have common reads throughout the year so that we can um, calibrate our beliefs and our values and our behaviors um, so that we can develop common language and just really to help us connect as, as a district leadership team. And book clubs can happen a lot of different ways. You can you know, read a chapter, read a few pages, get together, talk, discuss, um, read some more, come back together, talk, discuss. Uh, that's one of my favorite ways to be engaged in a book club, but given all of our very busy schedules and running our school system, um, I thought that we would just give ourselves some time to independently read our, our first selection and then come back together and have this conversation in a very public way at a school board workshop meeting. <coughs> so our, um, the text I chose for us um, for the first read is Our Kids, The American Dream in Crisis uh, by Robert Putnam. And I chose this book because I, I think that um, there's a lot happening in our country right now that we really need to be aware of. And one of the things that's, that's happening at a rapid pace is this opportunity gap keeps widening. Um, you've heard a lot of conversations about this during this election cycle. Uh, the conversations are continuing. And um, I had the opportunity to hear Ralph Putnam speak at Harvard University about this book, about the research, uh, and the why behind the book. And so um, one of the things that I thought was really interesting when I first heard him speak and a half ago was that um, they started this research with the intent that it would become the, the center of the political conversation during this presidential election. So I think that as we're discussing it today, you're going to hear my colleagues um, and our school board leaders 
members talk about um, some of the things that, that still are questions for us as a country and as a nation. But um, it's our job as the educators to make sure that we're aware of what's going on and that we're being not only responsive but really proactive because we are, you know, we're, we're in the driver's seat in terms of making sure that our kids are prepared for what the future will bring. So um, we have, uh, we've done a little pre-planning so that everyone can have a chance to speak. I don't want to be the only one to talk about this. And I thank everyone for being a good sport and, and working through it. Um, I thought it was a great read, but we'll see what the overall um, sense is of the group. <coughs> um, and just for the public who may not be aware of this book, it, it's comprised of six chapters. And the first chapter really starts by um, talking about the myths and the realities of the American dream. And then um, chapter two is about families. And chapter three is about parenting. Chapter four is about schooling. Chapter five is about community. And then chapter six really said, talks about like, so what is to be done? Um, and in preparation for our uh, reading and just kind of thinking and reflecting on this text, um, I did provide a few questions for us to be thinking about. Um, so I hope that my colleagues found that helpful as they were reading through this, this text. So I, I guess again for the public so that, and, uh, so that you have a sense of what this book is all about, the main idea of the book is that income inequality has surged over the past century, creating a rising generation of children split merely by a caste-like economic divide. And um, when I first read this book, I was working in an urban school district, and I, you know, the, on the very first page, it talks about it being the tale of two cities, and I was like, oh, that's exactly what's happening here. Um, and then I went home to my husband's hometown in Casanova, New York, and I said to myself, that's exactly what's happening here. Um, and so Robert Putnam and his research team, they really start in his hometown of Port Clinton, Ohio. And um, they, they studied, actually, if you read through the actual you know, research notes in the back, they studied several different towns, but in this book they highlight five. Um, and they, and it takes you through a series of what, what Putnam calls scissor graphs. And so it's talking about, you know, rich kid opportunities versus poor kids opportunities. But again, for the point of the conversation and the public viewing, it's important to know how they define rich kids and poor kids. So rich kids um, in this text are considered kids who come from households where parents are educated. Um, with, with a four-year four college degree or more. And, and poor kids in this case um, are kids who, whose parents have a high school diploma or, or less formal education. And um, the, the socioeconomic label that attaches to that is really based on the research that keeps reoccurring over and over throughout the book where you know, students who come from educated households tend to be on the top part of the upward mobility piece of that graph, and children who come from less educated households, there's a strong correlation to socioeconomic status as well. So, um, anything else you think <coughs> we need to add for the, the public to kind of set it up? I think I would only add that um, there's a nice mix of what the data is. Um, the research data, as well as a, a narrative storytelling component, so it, it makes it a little bit more accessible. Perhaps. Absolutely, and it does do, it does share those contrasting portraits of low income and high income um, students. And some have even said that this is a groundbreaking examination of the growing inequity gap in our country. So, with that, I turn it over to my colleagues for any first thoughts that are impacting you, or have you wondering about our own practices and our policies here in the district? So I, I will add this piece, that whenever I read anything like this, I try to immediately think about uh, the connection with what we're trying to do in our school. And I've always worried about um, how do we ensure that all students have the supports they need to be successful in school. So I think this book, at times, talks a little bit about it. If it's a wealthy or a higher educated, sometimes they have networks and they have their connections with people that kind of help them know how to advocate for their children and to ensure that they're having all the supports they need. Whereas 
Sometimes, um, according to that book, you might have families that maybe uh, from poorer communities or whatever, they, their networks, so to speak, are kind of the family network, and it's a smaller network. And so perhaps they haven't had those discussions with people they know that can guide them on how to ensure their children have support. So the takeaway for me is that we have to always be mindful of that. We, it's our responsibility to make sure there are supports for all students, regardless of income, um, family, where they live, any of those things. I think it's our responsibility to make sure we are communicating all the supports and we're reaching out to ensure that all students can be successful. So uh, that was my takeaway. I wanted to say that as I was reading this, um, and I really enjoyed it, and there was a lot that I, I really liked. One thing that I felt like um, seemed like a little bit of an oversimplification that I wanted to sort of complicate a little, and I think in support of what you're saying, is to me, um, well, I think something like a socioeconomic status is incredibly important, something that we should be incredibly vigilant about. I think that that also sort of, I don't know, sort of streamlines things in a way that we don't want to. And um, I was thinking about a 2001 article by David Brooks right after that election, um, where he was saying, he was suggesting that, that a more useful way of considering that conversation might be looking at it as red and blue America rather than a different socioeconomic group. And he was saying, because look, both groups have um, incredible economic diversity within that group, but the value systems are so different. And he gives some categories. So Red America likes mechanized sports and tends to vote conservative and tends to do this and that, whatever. Blue America tends to want to sail and ski and this and that. And, and so, so you, could, you can be of multiple different economic standings and still be within that group. And it's really a way of looking at ideology and value. And I think when we're talking about education, that's at least as important. Because I think that, that that a red America and a blue America is, is valuing education differently regardless of their socioeconomic class. And I see that all the time in Scarborough. One of the things that I noticed was that um, in Scarborough, yes, we do have uh, some low economic students. But um, I kept on asking myself, how low compared to other cities that you might be working in? So when you compare what we have here sometimes, and think of that as a low economic situation, I, I kept on thinking, I wonder what it's like in some other school districts and where that um, divide happens. Because um, some of our kids who might be in the low economic might be in a different situation in a different city or town. I can, I can piggyback on that. When, when, I, when I read what I read in the book, it reminded me a lot of some of some of you may have read her as well, Ruby Payne's work on poverty and uh, the multi-generational effect that that can have from literally generation to generation and how people literally become victims in many ways and not just economically, you know, not just economic poverty, but poverty of means, poverty of education, poverty of the ability, poverty of a, a lack of anything that makes them less fortunate than others. And so I was reminded of that in reading, you know, what I read. It's a good comparison to like, poverty at what level. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that in the parenting chapter, I found it really powerful. Um, in my version. It's on page 109 where um, they, they honed in on child development and what we know about child development and how critical um, different stages in, in cognitive and behavioral development occur, like, occur and how outside influences can impact that. But not only outside influences, but what we can do about it as a public school system. So, you know, skipping forward to what can we do about it, we've all been hearing this national conversation about preschool. Um, and it's, I think that this reminds me of how, how important the early childhood years are. Sometimes we get hyper-focused on college and getting kids ready for careers and life at the, at the high school level. Um, but the reality is that foundation is so critical. And, um, you know, one of the things I heard on an NPR interview about this book that actually made me pick it up was that, um, you know, schools are often blamed, particularly urban schools, for failing our kids. 
And it's not just the schools, right? Um, what we know about development, and we know about family cohesion, and we know about parenting, our kids are coming to us um, having experienced a lot and having gone through a lot of really critical developmental stages. And so the schools might be where it shows up, but that it really is a full community effort. Um, and when I, I, I just think about some of these adverse childhood experiences that can happen in any household, no matter what your socioeconomic status is, that's something that you know I'm, I'm really thinking a lot about and saying, so how do our policies help families who are in these situations? Do we have policies that, that maybe unintentionally um, create barriers for, for families and for, for our kids? Um, just to piggyback on, on that, too, I, and the, the chapter I read was six, but Jackie, <coughs> do I have permission to say something about <laughs> chapter six? Because I know you wanted to take the lead. No, 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 go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I just didn't want to say anything because I knew you wanted to do that. But it talked about um, if, if a family income could increase by $3,000 per family uh, during the child's first five years of life. That the increase on the SAT scores is by 20 points and that nearly a 20% higher income later on in life. It's amazing. That's Pretty significant for $3,000, you know, in, in the beginning years. But I think in our district, um, our K-2 teachers did a lot of work last spring with our preschools and making those connections. And we talked, if you recall, at a meeting where we brought somebody down from the state about you know, sh should we be looking at a, you know, a four-year-old program for our schools. And I think through your work, maybe not a jump to that because we have so many significant programs, but something in between where maybe we could partner better mm -hmm. with the programs that exist already to provide uh, professional training back and forth with them or to give them opportunities to come into meetings more like the ones you held in last spring in order to um, understand better where they were at because they seem to really appreciate that. So that may be a place where we could have some movement towards making some outreach opportunities <coughs> without actually hey, bringing in a four-year-old program right away. <clears throat> yeah, that work is continuing with at least one of our PLT groups. Um, and one of the things I was talking to a, a kindergarten teacher the other day about how some of the, it seems like parents today aren't as in touch with some of the developmental levels of kids. You know, we have sort of these high expectations and kids in kindergarten that, again, we're already looking at you know, where are they going to go to college, and, and they're missing the right now and where kids should be in that moment. And so we've been thinking about, so how do we, how do we provide some education and conversation about that to get people really more engaged in what their kids should look like and should be doing at that a different Because distance. my sense is that these programs don't necessarily have uh, teachers, qualified teachers and they're not paying enough for right. teachers to want to go. And so I think, you know, we can do some work with people who are there. They may only have high school degrees themselves who are taking care of our younger kids. Mm -hmm. I think one of the threads for me in this book and a couple of others that I've sort of looked at is the, the nurturing and the environment piece and the adverse childhood experiences that can happen. It doesn't really matter how much or how little money you have, that stuff still happens. And then the development of character and grit and resilience and all those kinds of things, that whole field of character education seems to me to play a really important role because, because if, they are that, if they're strong, they'll get through it. So many of the kids in this that did have the resilience made it through stuff. But it's, and especially with the way the world is working right now, I think character education becomes even more important, an intentional approach to character. Mm -hmm. we, we are very fortunate in the town of Scarborough in that we don't have to deal with the same level of, of poverty and need as even Portland does. And we don't have to 
deal with the upheaval in some families that that occurs in some Portland. For I, I would not, I, I don't I have agree a sister who's seven years younger than I, and she will say to me, "We grew up in diff two different families." When I talk about my young years with my parents, because when I was seven or eight years old, my father went off to the war. And my mother had to go to work. And I don't know if she liked that income, because when <coughs> dad came back, you know, she continued to work, which made a very different life for my younger sister. She doesn't remember my mother making muffins for breakfast, for example. Has no recollection of that ever occurring. And she'll say to me, well, you and Madeline really raised me. And how many times is that happening in families today because of the demand of the two parents working? That's number one. Number two, we as educators sometimes are very smug. And we have a superior attitude, and one of the things that I have worked on, especially when I worked in inner city Portland, was the lingo we use sometimes in front of parents. They don't know what the heck we're talking about, and I don't care if they've been to, ed been to college or not. We get into this education, what I call education ease, and they're embarrassed to ask about what we're talking about. I think we as educators need to take a step back sometimes and, and look at the child. We say we do this. And listen to the parent talk about their child and work together, not only in Scarborough, but we have to change <coughs> what's happening in our state for the benefit of our children. Why aren't we getting the same monies for our children with special needs and special talents as they're putting into charter schools and the virtual schools? Can you imagine what that money would do for all of our public schools? But it was people in the legislature people who want something different for their children and can afford it, who are changing the complex of education, of public education, and we have to fight for our children. The book doesn't give us the answers to that one. What we have to do is form coalition <coughs> with parents and taxpayers to improve the education of our children because we're getting cut off at the knees every time they meet in Augusta. And there is no educational leadership there. We haven't had a commissioner of education in two years. And I know I'm maybe preaching to the choir, but I have said this very thing this very week to the Maine School Boards Association. We've got to do something. And we can do something, but we can't do it alone. Jackie, you mentioned how fortunate we are in Scarborough because we you know, struggle with a lot of the struggles that other communities have. The, the flip coin that I see here and the theme of the book was our generations of children are indulged more and more by parents. They have everything. They don't know the value of things like previous generations, they, they aren't as self-motivated, they don't value, uh, they don't have intrinsic motivation for things. And that's kind of the theme that I see emerging in our schools today that happened in Port Clinton in a small population. In Scarborough, having grown up here, I can see the parallels with his experience in Port Clinton. And he had a land factory in Pine Point that went bust, but for the most part, <coughs> we didn't have the scissor chart before it went this way. I mean, Scarborough is so affluent now when, when I was growing up. It wasn't too far after 1959, but it was a poor community. 
And what we have now, what we had then, it would be unrecognizable. This facility, Scarborough High School, for example, just 20 years ago, you would not recognize it. So the resources we have, it just gives me perspective that I think it's important that that history of where we've come from. And we do have a lot because our demographics have given us a lot. And we want more, of course. We always could use more. But we are very fortunate. There's just a flip, a flip side to that coin that <coughs> us. even what Anne was talking about with character education. That's what it's all about, as far as I'm concerned. Um, what I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I, what John is saying, I kept thinking about reading this book, thinking our kids have so much, but the ones that don't, it's, it's such a bigger sort of spotlight on it in that there are kids, you know, there are kids getting whatever they want and continuing up that path, which makes it all the more difficult for those kids who aren't. Yeah, right. And so that was sort of what I kept coming back to, like how are we making sure, like David said, how are we making sure that those people, those kids are given the opportunity and not having to ask for the opportunity? Mm -hmm. And do we have our arms really wrapped around who those kids are, what level of um, <coughs> supports they need, and how to systematically apply those supports in ways that are in a, um, that they're that they're just there. They're not on an as needed basis, but they're, it's part of how we provide wrap around services mm -hmm. to all students because that's what all students deserve. Because in Scarborough, we charge to be in a club, mm -hmm. to play sports, to. To park your car, like there, where there's a lot of things that people, kids have to pay for. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're if you're on this track over here, where your parents are like, oh, sure, no problem, here you go, here you go, here you go, I invest twelve hundred dollars per kid for whatever, that's fine. <coughs> but I just I I worry about those kids that don't ask, and we don't know their potential. It could, whatever that is, could save them, and they're not going to ask. I think, though, when, I think, though, when we look at the wraparound and we look at our schools being the hub of our community, it isn't just looking for the economically disadvantaged. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right? I think that's almost an, a more visible indicator for us mm -hmm. to see, but there are so many others when you look at the early childhood in that early development, in that impact, it's not that visible. I mean, I was so struck um, on the chapter you were talking about, about the impact of executive functioning yes. that happens in brain development before the age of five. Yes. I mean, there are so many pieces when we truly look at wraparound that one, mm -hmm. You could have all the money, but you don't have that one significant person at home that's there for you. Mm -hmm. You know, that's reading to you every night, that's providing those other needs, even though you have, may have the best clothing, the newest bike, or, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. You don't so, have that social emotional yeah. support. And it kind of goes to what John was saying earlier about even though those children of affluent families, if they're given everything, they may not develop that emotional resilience. They may not be able right. to overcome that barrier when in inevitably it does arise in their adult life. So you're doing them a disservice as much as you are the students who don't have that affluent family. You've got two different types of dysfunction you, going on. How do you respectfully address that? Um, you know, and, and not put a, a value judgment on someone else's mm -hmm. choices and value. And yet, you know, that, that's a balance, too. Mm -hmm. For me, that was one thing that I didn't necessarily, as I was reading through it, made me feel uncomfortable, like almost oversimplifying that it was all about economics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, even though there's that list of risk factors that can cause problems for kids as they're growing, um, there can be people, and I'm sure there are many in this town, who are very affluent, on the surface looks like everything's cool, but a parent could have mental illness or a substance abuse disorder or you know, any number of things going on in their house. So yes, we are a mostly affluent community, but it doesn't mean we don't have kids that don't need supports or otherwise they're gonna lose out um, on a lot of opportunities and continuing on the trajectory that 
their economics say that they should be following. Um, and just for people who haven't read the book at home, if there are any, there might be some people at home who haven't read the book. Um, I just want yes. this, this yes. book yes. yet. They will, they'll be sold out at Little Moose and Barnes and Noble. Um, it's very fact-based, this book. I mean, there's... Yeah. There are anecdotal stories, but then it like hits you with the facts. And some of them stop me dead in my tracks. And there's one on page 116 about Canadian researchers found differences in the brain waves of children from lower and upper class backgrounds that suggested the former had more difficulty in concentrating on a simple task, apparently because their brains had been trained to maintain constant surveillance of the environment for new threats. Mm -hmm. That stopped me dead in my tracks. Mm -hmm. It's so heartbreaking to think of a five-year-old not being able to focus, you know, five-year-olds don't have a ton of focus, but what if it's because they were constantly look, you know, looking for danger or looking out for the next thing they need to protect themselves against? And, you know, it just, of course their brain isn't going to function the same way as a five-year-old whose only worry is about, you know, what snack they're going to have when they get home from school and what, you know, activity they have to go to after. Just really, that one just really killed me. There isn't, I don't think there's a school in the country, including... <coughs> maybe not including private independence, <coughs> where there are kids coming in who aren't functioning because they haven't eaten or their dog died or there there was a big fight or there was screaming or the, I mean that's everywhere yeah. Yeah. And, and I think it just I don't know it behooves us to pay I know what I know we pay attention to it and teachers are attentive and they build relationships which is what the whole thing is about so that they can learn that that kid didn't have breakfast but it's mm -hmm. yeah. it's a very slow tiny one-to-one -one process yeah. I think and for me, part of what I reflected on as well in that same chapter and thinking about some of the science around the developmental piece is the importance of having uh, good programming in schools that we're dealing with fidelity. That mm -hmm. it's, it's really, <clears throat> now that we know more about the science of it, I guess, that that will inform how we uh, help kids out um, and moving forward with that. So. And I would just add to the, the toxic stress part that is highlighted in the parenting chapter. But you know, this afternoon I had the opportunity to attend the, the high school's faculty meeting, building meeting, and some of our students, our LGBTQ students, presented and they were sharing their experiences in Scarborough High School and the way that the stress, the toxic stress that they're experiencing as adolescents with, impacts their functioning and impacts their ability to come to school impacts their ability to be really present and able to learn. And they did such a, a brave, courageous thing by talking to all of the teachers in the high school and the leadership um, about their experiences. And it brings me right back to, to this work and that it's ongoing, you know, that there's, we really have to know our kids. Um, all of our kids mm -hmm. and make sure that all of our kids are all of our kids all the time and that sounds like you know rhetoric but I, re I really mean that we have to know our kids if I could just add one more quick component too that I think it can also be something really really simple like screen time and how much screen time a kid has and what a kid is looking at and the degree to which a parent is monitoring screen time and you know some of you have heard me say this before but it is just it is the wild west out there and kids have access to things that they're not emotionally and cognitively ready to process and I think that that creates a kind of trauma as well too and I think that we're really as a culture just starting to come to terms with what this generation um, the effect I guess that they're having by, by looking at things that can be violent or exploitive or, or otherwise something that, that can do some real psychic damage. I think in, in, one of the fortunate things I think about Scarborough, and Kelly and I can attest to this in our work that we've done in the past at Project Grace, is that we are, I was constantly amazed at the kindness and the generosity of the people in this town. Uh, it, it just blows my mind. Well, you saw how fast the money came in and the food came in to the, to the Thanksgiving event. But it, it just, through, through the phone calls we get, we would hear from those parents that you have the kids, you have the kids. We're, we're qualifying in that office across the street who qualifies through every little detail of their life over the phone. And then, and you have the kids, and yet, on the other side is this amazing, giving community. 
that just, it blew me away. As much as hearing the stories of who's in need, this stuff really amazed me. Uh, the generosity that is in this town, the, the fuel assistance that comes in even, through the events that happen in the town, the, the food, the Thanksgiving meals, the Christmas presents, it, it's unbelievable. Uh, so I think we're so fortunate in, in having this community. I think at um, my level, at our level, I think the worst thing for us, for me anyway, is the families that won't ask, mm -hmm. that don't want to be identified, that don't want to ask. You can ask very cautiously, you can ask very privately, do you need some assistance? And they're too proud, too scared, too embarrassed, too whatever, to accept it. And the thought of kids being hungry on long weekends, the thought of kids not having books, clothes, whatever, is, is heartbreaking. You can do everything you can for them for the six and a half hours they're in your building. But you know they go home to not enough and not much you can do about it. And even things as simple as principal overrides for free and reduced lunches. We used to be able to have principal override privileges and that has changed through federal law or whatever. So, you know, you can offer it as many times as you want to families who are struggling to feed their kids and pay their school bills. But this is maybe the only meal they get. And you don't have the luxury of being able to do that as a principal anymore. You, instead, I'm making phone calls asking them how can I, can I help them pay their $100 school lunch bill and promising that their child will eat no matter what. And you know, it's not a lot, but it's a lot to them. Mm -hmm. so. um, I'm also doing a book study with the MPA of Teaching with Poverty in Mind. And the first day we were all in the course together, they were like, Scarborough, like, why are you reading this book? And, you know, I think our greatest challenge in Scarborough is just that, that yeah. right. people it makes really do not want to come forward and people um, really hide. There's a tremendous amount of shame about needing help, whether it's financial or otherwise, and it makes it really difficult to, to, to do some of the things that, or it's a more equalized community where everyone's kind of needing some kind of help we really have to seek and find and, and find different ways to reach out. So they're out there, and there's some real need. Definitely. And it's yeah. on display every day. You know, right. if you mm -hmm. look at the racks of lost and found as long as these two cables. And no one looks about means <laughs> dangling from it for weeks. <laughs> and, and you look at the kids who are coming to school Switch. without a coat. And, right. and, and yeah, the, it's, it's represented by the children. They're, they're pretty uh, intuitive about this stuff themselves. I, I almost think it's harder to have conversations about the inequity and the, the opportunity gaps in Scarborough because mm -hmm. there are so many who do yes. have and can do and are generous and, and than it was when I was in an, in an urban city where the need was so vast because um, it, it's sometimes harder to see. Yep. for a whole variety of reasons that we discussed here today. That makes me think, of, I, I was kind of on a roller coaster with that one as, was, as I was reading because I was thinking, oh, Scarborough has these great supports. We have these amazing things, that, you know, the Project Grace and the churches and the backpack program. But at the same time, I, I worry that we also have that isolation, that we don't have that commitment to the our kids concept mm -hmm. in the town. And you know there are a select group of citizens who still buy that and still want to be part of the community, um, but there are others who don't. And then you lose <laughs> sight of of the the children themselves and the families who are in need. So yeah. Just I, the, I kept going up and down. Oh, this is great. Oh wait, this is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Just as a case in point to the community we live in, that community Thanksgiving meal is not targeted to a single demographic. It is. Mm -hmm. Genuinely to invite everyone to come and have community, but when the um, information started to go out about it, we had over 40 volunteers in the first two days. We had like 40 pies already committed people to make, and we had three people signed up to eat. Oh, wow! So we're trying to change the conversation that you automatically are thinking because it's free. This right. must be for it must be for people who can't afford it, it instead yeah. of. We just want people to come and enjoy each other and be neighbors and not have to cook or clean or any of the things. But we had so many people ready 
at the drop of a hat, just, yep, I'll help. What do you want me to do? I'll be there all day. I'll be there both days. And only three people signed up to eat. Now we're, we're climbing. We're up to 60, but, you know, publicity is still coming out. There are ads in the papers today. But I just think that is really indicative of this town. Yeah. Yeah. Because if you can't afford it, you don't want to admit it that you can't afford it. Mm -hmm. Even though we know there are more than three people in this town mm -hmm. that can't, can't afford, afford to it. make their own Thanksgiving. There are a lot more that don't want to make it. Hands <laughs> 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 raised. Raise your hand if you're going to be there. <laughs> well, I can tell you right now, Kiwanis donated 100 turkeys to the Scarborough Food them. Pantry. Oh, so I don't scary. know how many others they need, but I do know that, that we committed to that and we did that, and I'm sure they're going to find families that will use them. Well, and that community building piece is another part of my agita because you've got folks who are growing up in a culture, and you read it here too, where they don't connect with their neighbors. Rich and poor, mm -hmm. they Our all houses talked are far about, apart. they all talked about, yeah, we used to sit on the stoop and we used to hang out. You know, maybe we were downtown, maybe our house was shabby, but we were all looking after each other's kids. And in the other neighborhoods, you know, you've, we had rich people, poor people, we've got lawyers, we've got longshoremen. Now it's all sort of, okay, we're each on our own little island. And it's tough to get people to want to come out and eat dinner with their neighbors. You know, it's, I think that's a real issue in Scarborough. I mean, new developments are closer together and the houses are closer together. But every development built in the last 25 years, there are two, three acre lots with garages Trees all around. Yeah, you pull in, you go in your house, no one sees you again. You know, you're home or not, nobody knows. But there's not, there's no like walking to the corner store or, you know, a right. right. little park in your neighborhood that everyone hangs out in because and no bunch of kids running backyard. around because they shouldn't be in the street because yeah. they'll get run over. Or, or run yeah. over well, that's, that's public. That's <laughs> awesome, too. Right. You know, Thanks, Joanne. The Great American Neighborhood was designed to hopefully change that right. Right. reality. But yeah. The diversity in this town, our policies around affordable housing, uh, right. a little bit here and there that assuage our guilt, you know, maybe right. as a community, but right. we could do a lot more, which means if we do, if we're successful, we'll have more diversity demographically <coughs> and racially, which yeah. is a big yeah. issue in this town mm -hmm. because those children feel isolated, I believe. Yeah. They're yeah. accepted really well, particularly at our developmental level. Kids are just, mm. they're so accepting, but. Mm. Boy, it's, uh, that hasn't changed in Scarborough for a long time. That, yeah. mm -hmm. that lack of diversity mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. getting better, but compared to Portland? Yeah. But that's a place where we can go in school, too, because, I mean, now I'm going to argue the flip side, which is that as my daughter's growing up in Scarborough High School, or all through K-12, mm -hmm. she had friends of all different socioeconomic levels. She'd go for a sleepover, and it would be, you know, a, a very modest, double-wide, or it would be a McMansion. Mm -hmm. And they can't, they didn't care. Kids mm -hmm. didn't care. You know, bring a sleeping bag, roll it out. This is my friend. And mm -hmm. she still has friends of all different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and that happened because of school. Because mm -hmm. she met those people at school that did things together and they saw past whatever their family situation was and realized that they were meant to be friends. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that, that's really powerful too. I want to go back though to your first point. And I think that that for me, you know, speaking strictly personally, my biggest challenge with Scarborough is is the the sense of isolation. And I think that sometimes assuaging guilt and volunteering is easier for people than actually participating and sitting at a table and being a part of community. Mm -hmm. And I think that the community needs to be one that's not just students with students, but you know. Um, how are we engaging our seniors? How are we engaging um, other members of the community? What are we doing to invite them to the schools? What are we doing to get our kids over there as well too? How, in a place where there's no natural community because of you know, c civic planning, there's no sort of town center, how can we create a metaphoric town center that really has people engaging beyond the schools? You know, um, earlier Elizabeth made a point about um, one of the groups that was out going to rake leaves, mm -hmm. they had right. X number of volunteers that were going to rake senior right. citizens' leaves. I think that, that that's a great way to get out into the community are the high school organizations or even the younger students. Mm -hmm. I know a lot mm -hmm. of them at, I think, like the Wentworth level had been going over to the veterans home mm -hmm. and at the middle school they've done that and I know that the younger kids connect in other ways mm -hmm. because they can't go to a lot of these places. But 
I think that that's a good way to keep getting the kids out into the community and bringing the community then back in as well. Mm -hmm. So the seniors coming to the play or the seniors coming over to Wentworth to go to the group uh, events that they have there in the community center. So I've said this idea a couple times probably to a select few, I don't know. But one of the things, when I look back at my community and where I went to school and where I grew up, I remember the adults and I remember the neighbors and the people that my parents hung out with or whatever, but I feel like if there was a way, and this may be crazy, I don't know, but to sort of when juniors or seniors get accepted to a college, to sort of promote that to like take them on a road show and go to Piper Shores or wherever to be like, these are your kids too. These are the kids in your community, and this is where they're going. This, you know, this is Bobby. He's going to Penn State or whatever, just to sort of sh connect them. So there's a level of, of feeling proud about, you know, this is where my tax dollars go, and, and this kid is going to succeed, and I helped get him there, or create a partnership where those high school kids go and play a game or or learn a trait, like learn something from the elders, just to sort of connect them. Because I think a lot of families now are sort of spread out, so you don't go every Sunday to visit your grandparents or hang out with the elderly. But there's something to be said about that, and, mm -hmm. and you learn from that. And I think elders in this town feel like, hey, you use my knowledge I don't just need something done for me. Right. I have things I can right. offer too. You don't have to just rake my leaves. Yeah. I used to be an engineer and can teach you this, or you know, mm -hmm. just some sort of way of connecting them. So, sometimes um, projects in school will um, help <coughs> connect with people out in the community. Um, you know, like I remember um, my daughter had an and uh, doing a, an interview with someone who was in a concentration camp. And from that relationship was over two years. Mm. It wasn't just the project. After going to meet the people, she continued to go there, you know, every other week to meet them. And it was important mm. to, you know, just be friends with them because they were in their 90s and she wanted to capture that. Mm. And um, so the project brought kids out into the community. And I think sometimes mm. the learning experiences that we do for kids, that helps to get them out there into that community through a project and something that they can um, <coughs> talk to the people with. So if a project that a teacher does sends the kids to Piper Shores to do something and they connect on maybe a field that they're interested with and they build a relationship, that I think helps to bridge some of those gaps there. Well, you know, if we have 3,000 children in our schools and we have 3,000 retirees, people on fixed incomes in our town, da -da 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 -da. <laughs> those are 3,000 voters, remember. The more that we can, I'm serious, the more we can get them engaged with our children in our schools, the, the better opportunity we have of passing a school budget, I'll tell you that. Well, to Jackie's yeah, point, on page on my page 213, um, in the community chapter, so somewhere around there for you, there's a whole section that talks about mentors and yes. the critical role that uh, adults outside the family play um, in helping children develop and realize their full potential. And so that theme keeps coming up, right? And, and who can be a mentor? And how do we connect kids with mentors? I think that we're already doing so many things that 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 will help our kids. Um, and I could stay here and talk about this stuff for days, but I also <laughs> want um, our school leaders and our school board to be able to rest and recover for tomorrow. So I just thought that if there was any, you know, we'll kind of go around and if there's any final point or if you're thinking like, I'm wondering if this could be done or, because um, I know I have about 50 of those wonderings, um, not just from this book, but from everything I'm learning about the community. And then we'll sort of wrap up with just like a whip around final word from the book. So this morning, um, Joanne and I attended the vocational school meeting. And so this is kind of directed for the high school. 
Uh, one of the things that came up was that by the time the kids who go to the vocational school get transported over there, they often haven't had anything to eat. And um, so if, I don't know who would look into this, but whether or not what time our kids get over there, but the, they, the vocational school was saying, well, they arrive just in time to go into their class. So if you could look into that just to see. That's not accurate. No, no, no. we open up our breakfast at 7 at the high school. They don't oh, leave okay. until 7.25 or 7.30. Right. And most of the time when I'm out in front, they're standing out there for 15 or 20 minutes waiting for the bus to leave. So they have plenty of opportunities to they grab something. Time to get something to oh, eat. Yeah. Okay. okay. One of the things um, okay. that uh, I happen to have a conversation with Peter Esposito about recently is he's looking into um, trying to provide a vending machine at the high school, and this is a work in progress, so he's going to be mad because I'm promising this on TV now. But uh, <laughs> nobody's watching, don't worry. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, but Emma's listening. And he Liz's said listening. that there's there's such a thing as a vending machine that they're they're working on a project of one that will tie into the point of sale system, so it's part of the school lunch computers, so you can like use your lunch money or your free and reduced or whatever you are, but they can stock it in. Uh, from the cafeteria, the kitchens themselves can put a sandwich in there or yogurt or um, you know something that can be kept cold um, and healthy and prepared by us and part of school lunch, but not requiring you to go through a line in a cash register. Right. Um, so that was kind of an interesting idea. He and I are exploring that. He's talking with this vendor and trying to connect them with the point of sale software people, and uh, that might be something that we can do to serve kids who are in a hurry. For whatever reason, take it in the home. morning. Could they take it home with them? Absolutely. If they don't have dinner waiting for them and they know this, then mm -hmm. they could get a sandwich out of the vending machine I think at it 2 o'clock and yeah. take it home with them. I, I think it could lunch. open up some interesting possibilities where, you know, we only have a limited time where we can serve lunch. Right. Or yeah. Literally serve it in the cafeteria right. with everybody there. Um, it's it's an interesting thought. So So if I if I may add to that, just so you see the full scope of that, <coughs> in, 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 um, at the high school in terms of students being <coughs> hungry and the change in our schedule. Um, Peter and his kitchen manager, Leslie, and I have met, and their plan is actually, uh, in addition to what Kate just mentioned, which is a specific vending machine in an area that, that kids can access anytime, we're going to have carts placed in a specific area where it's grab and go. Mm -hmm. Our in-house personnel will bring it up, set it up, and be there to supervise. All they have to do is bring one of their cafeteria ladies to sell it. We're going to get an iPad or whatever for them to be able to process it so it comes out of their lunch account. So we have a lot of things like that in the works, grab and go types of things. But it takes a little bit of time, as Kate mentioned, because you have to get the resources and it's something new. But we're working on that whole piece of grab and go and let students be able to get things throughout the course of the day, especially if they're in a hurry when they come to school and they didn't get time to have breakfast, which I'm sure Thomas and Lizzie would be happy to pass along to everybody that that's in the works. <laughs> It'll make a lot of people happy. Yeah. Sue Ketch, are you still saving youngsters and getting them into alternative and underneath that's that's like her job. We can chuckle over it. But I admire the work that Sue has done over the years with with youngsters who may not stay in school or finish school and and she does almost anything possible to get them through high school and I I'm not saying we don't have everybody in our schools who are trying to do that, but she has set an example for us, I think, in Scarborough. And and I mentioned earlier the, you know, the virtual schools and the charter schools, and maybe we should be looking at some of those techniques mm -hmm. for youngsters who, who struggle with the regular, regular classroom, just as we've been able to save some through alternative education at Scarborough High School. We were one of the first to do it. I, I know we were, and, and it's been what, 30 years? Uh, no, not quite. Probably 30. at least 25. 
been a long time. We're doing some wonderful things. I mean, Barbara has set up some programs at her school for students who are struggling and uh, that are outside the box, so to speak. So that, that's one of the things I'm proudest, some of the things I'm proudest of, that, that we are looking outside of the box to help our children succeed. We have to do more of it, I think, because we're we're receiving children who need more challenge, number one, than we've ever had been able to give them in the past. And, and just by virtual having a computer and a television set and all of those things, they're getting up-to-date information every day and some of it we don't want them to have. So it's a, it's a challenge for us to stay abreast of what they need to know and to stay a step ahead of them sometimes. But that's our job. Mm -hmm. But we can do it. We've done it before and we can continue to do it. But thank you. I have to, I, I appreciate the nod, but I have to say that Andy McVeigh and Sarah Kappelman and Christina Gerber are on the front lines of Altec <coughs> making that daily difference for those kids. and getting our, probably some of our most at-risk students through high school and, and through that next phase that this book lines out so much. So really, they deserve the daily um, accolades for all the work they do to support, educate, and love those kids. Really? They do a great job. You provided that leadership. Thank you. I, I, I'd like to say, I think Jody started to mention in the beginning, I'd certainly be remiss if I didn't bring up page 174 in your book that, um, that it's certainly not as important as a child needing clothes and food, but I also worry about those kids that don't participate in after school activities because of some financial burden. Because clearly, if you, if you read that section, it's the quote unquote silver bullet to um, ensuring that our children are successful is is their involvement and participation in after school activities. And so and that and I think he did a really good job laying laying that out, um, you know, regardless of your um, you know, regardless of your of your situation. Um, it's kind of a silver bullet. Michael, and I, that really stuck with me, though, as I read uh, the community section also. So on uh, 258, it really talks strongly about um, after-school activities, mentors, and extracurricular activities. And I see my middle school students, only those students who have had those opportunities for um, club yes. um, sports, they're the only ones that go out for a, a, a school sport. I've talked to kids. They say, well, we don't have a chance to play because yes. we never had an opportunity to play soccer or never had an opportunity yeah. to play basketball. And Which is crazy. It, it is, is crazy, but I would like to partner with the community and get a community center or something for a place for these kids to go. I mean, I think we could partner. A lot of kids go to that library still, yeah. and they're yeah. hanging out. They need something to do. I think transportation is a transportation is a huge issue for issue. to <coughs> offer these, events. and that's why they walk over mm -hmm. to the library. Mm -hmm. But what, what Barb and I have talked about is that some of these kids have already been sort of um, disqualified by the yes. time they're in seventh grade yes. Yes. because they yes. haven't been playing yeah. Yeah. The, 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 you know, soccer song. since they were yeah. five years old. Yeah. And that's mm -hmm. compounded by the fact that so if you don't have the means or the family support or the whatever to start playing soccer when you're four, right. but then also they come to, to our school system and we have all of these fees. I mean, it's yeah. pay to play, mm -hmm. it's pay to have access. And so mm -hmm. I, I just think that if we truly want to create a community where there's equal opportunity, we have to take a hard look at our, our pay to play policy. And, um, you know, I, I, I understand that that creates a greater impact in some ways on the rest of the community. But like Mike said, not only does it lead to 
um, success in high school, it leads to success in life. Mm -hmm. And so the, the return on that investment, the value add on an investing in our kids is remarkable. There's nothing better for us. All to of this is what really stuck out to me too about the book and not only the extracurricular activities, but how closely that's linked with mentoring. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You find mentors in those extracurricular activities. And the, a phrase that I really highlighted was the privatization of support for children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just came tonight with this in my head from the um, soccer slideshow over there for the club sports. And just looking at those kids thinking, they don't have any idea how lucky they are that they, first of all, have parents who paid for that, them to do it, who drove them to 35 games over the course of <laughs> this past season and three practices a week. And they have fantastic coaches who are, who are doing such nice work, but we paid for that, <laughs> you know? And um, so that really, really stuck out to me too. And that's not how it was when I went to school. You know, I had a ratty field hockey uniform that was issued mm -hmm. by the school and it was gross, but we wore it and, <laughs> you know, and we, it was wearing them. <laughs> they, in Dexter, Maine, they might be. So. Um, so I did not read the book because I didn't know there was a book to be read. But this is one part where I know I can chime in. So I think going off of what you were saying about the extracurriculars, when I moved here, I moved here at the beginning of my sophomore year, for those of you who don't know, I had already played soccer for 13 years. And I think it kind of, I felt like, I couldn't keep playing when I got here because I hadn't been playing with that same group of people since I was in pre-K. So I think not only just letting people know that they have options of things that they can be involved in, but also just getting to the root of it and making sure that all of those groups are being as inclusive as they possibly can because <coughs> thank goodness <coughs> that I found my crazy theater people because if I hadn't I don't know what I would be doing because you'd be in jail. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Stranger things happen. <laughs> but, um, so, Lizzie, what you're saying is that you feel like there's a social barrier there, not yes. just a yeah. financial yeah. barrier. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But it's like these are my buds, right. and, and the thing is, yes. I think you don't belong. Even tying into mm -hmm. the financial aspect of it, that we've kind of been, or I've been listening, you guys have been talking about for the majority of the night. Um, I think it's. Because a lot of families in Scarborough are so fortunate and they do have the opportunity and the ability financially to, you know, have their kids involved in so many things and stuff like that and they're not, they can at least provide necessities and then <coughs> often a little bit more than that. Um, I think that sometimes the few kids who are in the position where they can't, it's like they don't, we don't really know what to do with that. So I, it's very, it's sad, but I think there is a social barrier there too. Mm -hmm. And so I think at the root of it, just making sure that they're, they know they're still part of the Scarborough community, even though they're not, you know, like you said, their parents can't pay for them to be on three club teams and be driving to different states every weekend. Mm -hmm. So I think that's kind of the root of it to improve the entire experience mm -hmm. for students. Because even if they can't play nine sports and they can't afford to do all that, at least they're coming to school and they're knowing that like, hey, these are my people. Like this is my community. So And I also think along those lines, Lizzie, is that there is a false hope for some parents in this community that if they do those kind of sports, they're going to get an athletic scholarship. And they're banking on doing all of that so the athletic scholarship is going to take place. Mm -hmm. And it sometimes becomes a very sad reality for the parent and for the student yeah. in the end. Um, but mm -hmm. to bank on the sport getting you a, a scholarship. Um, starting younger and younger. It starts younger and younger. Um, I know when I was a principal, people would come in and I'm transferring my child here because they need to be in a public school mm -hmm. sports setting because they're gonna get an athletic scholarship. That's our goal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think so that creates that click and calm. Um, I, I think that's an important thing too, um, that you know a lot of parents have this false hope that 
you know, sports are the answer to this problem. But the thing is, is that there are so many extracurriculars other than sports mm -hmm. that can be a far easier path and a far better path, I would argue, in order to get <laughs> scholarships in that, like, extracurriculars like debate and academic decathlon yep. mm -hmm. cost far less money and also give a lot more returns in right. terms of education and also um, many ways self-discipline in education and how you manage your work. Mm -hmm. right. Very good. Yeah. Very good point. I, I, kind of <coughs> what you're saying about it starting so young. Um, I was so lucky I got to coach a third and fourth grade girls soccer team for community services and that was a blast but I had a parent tell me that we needed to be disciplining their kids more because I want her to be able to get an athletic scholarship when she's in high school. And I was like, she's nine. <laughs> like, let her run around and pick flowers on the field and uh, dance just, around in the goalie box. come work for us? <laughs> Over here in the too. Like, let her dork around and be a kid for a few seconds because you know, that's going to get to the point where they don't have that option. So I think Absolutely. it's, and it's hard because obviously that's not something that we can just be knocking on people's doors and say, you need to raise your kids differently. Because <laughs> that's not the first one. You're not supposed to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but that speech, goes but back to that sense of community and yeah. what are our community values and how do we support that and how do we engage parents in really healthy ways. And not to belabor the conversation, but to go back to the kids that can't and don't. I mean, just to get kids to school, if they miss the bus mm -hmm. and there's no other opportunity for them to get there, mm -hmm. you know, it's really hard in this community with very little transportation opportunities. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a six-year-old who wants to come to school more than anything, but mommy doesn't wake up right. because she either works late shift or doesn't wake up for whatever reason and you know they can't come to school and they miss it and there's no way for me I I'd go get them you know they're just down the street but I can't so they miss out on the day and that mm -hmm. is heartbreaking you know yeah. it's and then they come the next day and they've missed and they're disconnected and they don't feel like they belong and they don't you know just the like time and I'm sure that happens at every level you know yeah. now before we go did the superintendent tell her team about this new <laughs> marker? I did not. You did not. not we found this at the Maine School Board's <laughs> convention. It's a highlighter, but on the other end is a highlighter eraser. So if you, <laughs> if you make a mark, and oh, I didn't want to highlight that one, that you can exciting. erase it. I like the um, highlighter. Fair warning on those uh, highlighters, though, is that they don't erase non-erasable highlighters. <laughs> they only work on the erasable highlighters. There you go. Jody had one more thing. I just have one more thing, and then I know we want to go. I was just sort of playing in my head again with the senior citizens and, and high school students. Those high school students, some of them may be able to connect with the stories of the seniors past because they have come, they have come from, right? So probably the majority of the senior citizens they're talking to do not come from extreme wealth and, and exaggerated incomes and all of that way back in the day. And it may be a place where they can relate to growing up in, in needing more or, or working hard to um, get what they had or how, how they succeeded or how they overcame something. So it may just be a way for them to connect to those seniors. I was just thinking that through. So I'm saying it so then I don't have to think about it. Anymore. So I don't know if we're still online or not, but I was just going to say, in my opinion, I believe that this book belongs on the shelf of, oh, of anyone concerned about equal opportunity. 
And so if you enjoyed it, please pass it along to someone else. And um, it's my hope that these conversations don't end tonight, but that we use this book to kind of be our foundation and the source of many conversations to come as we think about how we really close the opportunity gaps here in Scarborough. Mm -hmm. so thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have a motion to adjourn? Do we adjourn? Second. All in favor? We're adjourned.